condensed. So we're going to hit everything, it's just going to be condensed. Um, what I wanted to do, we're going to have to be quiet to tell whichever room is being loud to shut up. Um, <laughs> so I want to show you guys a video from the program, the Directed Change program. I realize that this projector has somewhat of a speaker, not a great speaker, so I'll have to listen intently. Uh, but I just wanted to show you one of the thumbs from that program. So when you come to Directed Change, up here at the top, you'll see a tab that says Watch and Use Films, and that's where you're going to access all the films. Over here, when I was talking about those uh, school-based resources, we have for schools here. So I'll just show you what that looks like when you go here. So for schools, remember that Assembly Bill 2246, EB2246, all of the resources and training. So you can look at what does the uh, Department of Education say about it. Uh, there's their model policy, a bunch of resources uh, to address staff training, student programs, that tool that I mentioned, that uh, suicide prevention from SAMHSA is there, and a variety of lesson plans, uh, inter uh, things for intervention, post-mention. When you come to the Watch and Use Film staff up here at the top, it'll take you down. Uh, these top four uh, are PDFs that have some of our best films over the years listed. We've been doing this program for we're in our seventh year now. We've received over 3,000 films from students around California. It's pretty amazing films as you're going to see. We also, so we have mental health, we have suicide prevention, and we have through the lens of culture where youth are encouraged to explore these topics through the lens of culture. That might be a defined culture like Latino culture, it might be uh, LGBTQ culture, it might be trans culture, it might be job culture, nerd culture, so whatever culture is they define as and how this applies to them. So we also, in that, uh, Films for Diverse Communities comes through that. Uh, and so we have films in a variety of languages, from all to all to sign language, to uh, Spanish, to uh, just a variety. So you can go down and you can look at films from across the years. I'm just gonna show you one really quick that I think is pretty cool. Me and my brother are only a year apart, and I've always been best friends. My brother has always had my back, and I don't know what I would do without him. My brother has always been the happiest kid I know. But around last spring, he started to change, and he began showing signs of suicide, isolating himself, and he seemed to lose interest in just about everything. It was time for me to be there for my brother. I asked him if he was okay, and he told me how he was struggling. Together we reached out for help. Although each day may be a battle, I still have my brother, and that's all that matters. If you or somebody you know needs help, call 1 800 273 TALK. And again, that's just one example, obviously, that's, uh, you know, um, kind of, I hate to say, but I, you know, typical boys, uh, but I love that. I love that the guys are, or you know, typical, whatever that would mean to you. But, um, you know, that, there's that one. I want to show you another one. Um, Oh, and also when you come to the Films for Diverse Communities, it'll have a short synopsis so you know what language it's in, what uh, what groups it targets. So uh, we've got some pretty amazing films uh, from trans youth. Um, and that seems to be an LGBTQ um, community that a lot of them seem to focus on, on trans issues. Um, but this is one that's in Spanish that I want to show you. Si quieres ir a dos meses, te tenía el pensamiento suicida. 
Um, I was angry. One of the emotions we don't talk about is survivors of losses, the anger that we have, because we feel kind of embarrassed or ashamed of it. But I was furious at Jesse. I was sad. One of the things we don't get to do as survivors of suicide loss either is just be sad because somebody has died. We have to be sad because somebody died by suicide. We don't just get to grieve. We have to grieve, which brings in guilt and shame. And so the next day I was, I was getting ready for school. And my mom, uh, you know, she saw me on the way out the door. And she said, honey, you don't have, you don't have to go to school today. It's OK. Let's take a couple days off. And I was determined. I said, no, I got to go to school. And I didn't know why um, until I walked to my fourth grade geometry class. And when I walked in, that's when I realized that the whole time I'd been thinking there was a, maybe there was still a chance that when I walk in today, Jesse's going to be there. This is all a bad dream. I'm going to snap out of it. And instead of what happened that day and every day for the rest of the years, I sat next to my best friend's empty desk. And so one of the things I'm really passionate when I work with schools is teaching them how to respond after a suicide. Most schools don't make plans to respond after a suicide until it happens. And by that point, it's too late. The damage is already done. And this was great, this was the mid-90s, and it was the dark ages as far as suicide is concerned. Uh, but nobody talked to me, not one adult came up and said, hey, are you okay, you want to talk? If Jesse had died in a car accident, if Jesse had died of cancer and illness, I would have been wrapped around with support. And all the adults around me, nobody, everybody was scared to say anything, so we just left it. And so I was left to deal with this, this pain, this tragedy in silence until my senior year. My father came to me. As I mentioned, he's also a cop. The police department was looking at endorsing a youth suicide prevention program called the Yellow Ribbon Suicide Prevention Program. And he asked me as a peer counselor, as a link crew, as a, as a teenager who lost a friend suicide, could I come and just thumbs up, thumbs down, should, you know, should they endorse me? And I was so excited just from the title of the program, the Suicide Prevention Program, because I've been talking about sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and all the other ways that teenagers can die. One way that my best friend died by suicide was by suicide. No one had ever talked to me about that. So I was I was in all in from the get-go. And I walked away from the training feeling really empowered, thinking, man, you know what? If someone would have told me this before Jesse, maybe, you know, maybe I would have been able to say it. If someone had told Jesse that it's okay to ask for help, maybe he could save himself. If someone had told me to create the space and you know, because looking back, I didn't know what warning signs were, what warning signs were, but I knew something wasn't right. Maybe if someone had told me, hey, if you see this, ask the question, talk to somebody, get it over. So anyways, I went to my principal and I gave him a packet of information and I said, hey, we need to have this program. And he looked at me and he said, come back in a few days, I'll look at it, we'll talk about it. So I came back a few days later and uh, he said, no, I'm not really busy, come back in a few more days. And so I came back a few days later and I got the same response, hey, Stan, I got really busy, I'm a principal, other things come up, uh, came up, why don't you come back in a few more days? So we did this dance for a couple months. Until finally I walked into his office and I just said, uh, yeah, I, looked, I walked in and he, he just looked at me. He's like, look, I haven't had time to look at it. You're a good kid. I trust you. If you think this is something we need to do, you go raise the money. We'll make it happen. So I went out and I raised the money. And we flew the founders out from Colorado. They had lost their son to suicide. And as we used to do, and I strongly educate schools not to do this anymore, but how we used to do it. We gathered all 3,000 kids in the gym to have a really intimate conversation about suicide. <laughs> and so here the founders are about to speak, and a couple minutes before they begin, they look at me and they say, hey, Stan, we thought about what you're going to say. And I freaked out. I was like, no, I did all the work. If you build it, they will come. They're here. You know, do the, do the thing. And they said, we really think your classmates would like to hear from you. And so I froze and I freaked out. And I froze. I remember that in my writing seminar class, I've written a poem in memory of my friend Jesse. It was the first time I ever communicated any emotions about it. And so I reached in my backpack and I pulled out this poem. And so here I am. And for my senior year, I progressed myself. I had gone from that nerdy freshman to, you know, a pretty popular senior kid. And as a senior, all you're worried about is your reputation. And here I am in front of 3,000 of my classmates talking about suicide and reading a damn poem. And I am just mortified about why have I done this? This is stupid. Why did you ever think this was going to be any good anybody? And so I stumbled through the presentation. I went straight home, went straight to bed. I was getting up for school the next day, just ready for battle, just thinking this is going to be the end of everything. Like, I'm just going to get ridiculed and bullied. And as I was walking onto campus, the attendance lady had a window that faces the front of the school so that she could see everybody as they come on. And as I was walking onto campus, we made eye contact, and she walked out the back of her, her office and came strolling towards me. And she had an envelope in her hand to me. And she walked up to me and she said, and I remember these words very specifically, she said, I have a gift for you. 
And I opened up the envelope and it was a letter from a girl named Sarah. No last name, no last initial. To this day, I don't know who Sarah is. And in the letter, Sarah told me that she'd been thinking about killing herself, that she'd been thinking about suicide for a long time. She was actually thinking about killing herself yesterday. And she happened to show up on the first day in her life that she heard somebody else talking about suicide. And she thanked me for sharing my pain, and she thanked me for sharing my hope. And she told me that that poem that I was so embarrassed about reading in front of my classmates, apparently some kids had gotten a hold of it, and they made copies of it, and circulating all through campus all day. And she told me that her and all her friends were going to post it next to their beds and read it every morning to remind them of their reasons for living. And she went on to thank me for saving her life. And I wanted to share this story with you, and I share it in most of my trainings. Because I don't want ever, I don't want anyone to ever underestimate the role that they can have in helping somebody find their reasons for living. Because I was a 17-year-old boy, with no training in mental health, no training in suicide prevention, but simply because I was willing to say the word suicide, simply because I was willing to speak the S word, I was able to help somebody navigate to help a little bit. And I have a saying that goes, when we speak the name of the beast, we will retreat. Only by talking about suicide, even if we don't have all the answers, even if we don't know what the solution is, we start to prevent suicide. We start to reduce that risk of suicidality. And I use that term very specifically, reminding somebody of their reasons for living. Because again, I talked about this earlier, but it's on them to find that reason. It is on them to decide to live or not. But we can't prevent suicide. What we can do is help people stay. We can help people find reasons for living. So, um, anyway, so that, to answer your question, how did I get involved in this work? From that point, I started volunteering with the program. I uh, worked with them for about a decade um, or so, and then I realized I would never be able to make a living doing that, working for a nonprofit as a youth coordinator, and so I went into consulting about seven years ago. So anyways, that's me. Um, and so now I work, uh, I have a couple contracts with the state, a couple contracts with the counties. I work with Fresno County and San Diego County, uh, helping them just kind of look at the big picture. A lot of strategic planning around suicidality. I do a lot of trainings, a lot of training the trainers. Uh, just try to hit it on all fronts. So, uh, yeah. Would you share your phone or do you share your phone? Uh, it's a horrible phone. Oh. It's, like, <laughs> it's, really it's like everything is like, it's a high school phone. It's like, there's the same number of syllables and every word rhymes and so it's it's somewhere on the internet, I'm For sure. sure. <laughs> um, I probably should have at least a copy of it laying around somewhere, but um, it's called I'm still here because you were there. I probably could I'll think about it. I probably could remember it, so I mean I'd like to have a copy that was powerful. Well it's so it's a story, it's it's me Imagining what Jesse must have felt like, and then imagining what the different uh, had, had I been able to be there for. So, uh, Did you make before? Or was someone else? No, I just wrote it. We had a oh, okay. we had an assignment right center right at home. Oh. So yeah. Sorry to put you guys. I promise you, think it's better than this. It's really it's a high school problem about suicide. So, uh, I take your name in here. There's a bunch of stuff that comes up. <laughs> So, you have to have me not be a conference. So, you would say Thomas was working for over 19 years. So, it's a problem. Probably not too many headings to come up with that. So, I don't know. I'll try to find it. If I find it, I'll sit down and look at everybody. Um, uh, I know we have a sign in for everybody. And it, uh, but do we have emails for everybody? In case there's any follow up emails that we want to do? If not, we can do another. List of I know what you want to do is sign again. But no, if you're then interested, then. Uh, maybe we can just pass I'll send out something with the name and emails, yeah. and if you guys want to stay connected, we can send stuff out. So, all right. So with that, we have uh, about an hour, and we're going to cover screening and safety planning in that order. So, uh, with that, uh, another conflict of interest. I have no conflict of interest and nothing to disclose. So you guys know way too much about me already. Uh, signings and references. Uh, a lot of what the, this training is based on, that Columbia, one of, there's a few things for the Columbia screening tool. One is that it's, it's probably the most endorsed assessment tool. One of the strengths about it is that it's for lay people. It is not for this or for that profession. It is intended with their, the idea that the more people that are trained to do a proper risk assessment, because a lot of the people we think know how to do a risk assessment have never been trained. Uh, the more people that are trained in a, in a simple tool, um, and on their web and on their website, CSSRSColumbia.edu, it's called the Columbia Lighthouse Project. They have a ton of resources. They have videos, they have webinars, 
Uh, and basically what I did is pulled a bunch of information from that uh, to do that. With that, we addressed this earlier. You obviously know suicide is very personal for me. We know that it's affected other people in this room. You're in a safe place. If you do need to step out for a moment, I won't take any disrespect. I'd rather you stay in here with us and work through it together, but I understand if you can. Um, but just know that, that you're not the only one out there who's been touched by this. A couple of things is, um, and then we need to start as a basis when we get into assessment. Talking about suicide is not suggested, does not make it more likely. If anything, talking about suicide makes it less likely. Uh, again, speak the name of the beast where we're treated. Um, open discussion is more likely to be experienced as relief. I've talked about this as that pressure valve. For those of you who have said somebody and asked openly, are you thinking about suicide? 90% of the time I ask that question, I see the shoulders relax, deep breath come out, it's like, oh my God, I finally get to talk about this. And the risk is when we don't ask about it. Um, I talked about this earlier, but again, just to remind, uh, we tried to get rid of the term commit, trying to use the term died by suicide or attempted suicide uh, to get away from these stigmatizing and biased words. Again, I mentioned this earlier, but part of the reason why Columbia looks at this as wanting more people to be able to assess is we need more people that are in touch with the folks down here to be able to streamline and triage so that the folks up here in the highest risk are getting the highest, the highest level of support. Dr. Kelly Bosner is one of the creators of the Columbia Screening Tool. I heard her present a couple years ago, and she said, if everybody's on high alert, then nobody's on high alert. I couldn't agree more. If we're sending everybody, if we're pressing the win button for everybody that says suicide, we're never going to have the capacity to respond, but we're also going to be having a ton of false negatives. Uh, there's a lot of research that's been coming out lately that hospitalization can actually increase risk of suicide for people that are at lower risk levels. So, Somebody who maybe doesn't need to be hospitalized still gets put through a 5150 process, gets put back in the handcuffs, back in a police car, can't go to work for one or two days. That can be a more traumatizing experience. You know, so I, there's a lot of debate. Not everybody's going to agree with this, but I don't always think that the hospital is the appropriate place for somebody who's having thoughts of suicide. For some people, absolutely need to go to a place where they have that 24 hour wraparound support. Many people, if not most people, I believe can be responded to with less intrusive levels of response. For example, what if a middle-aged male uh, is having financial issues, is concerned about his job, and you put him on a 5150 hold and put him into the hospital? He may lose his job. He may be safer for 24 to 72 hours, but now he's going to be at increased risk when he gets out because now he's also maybe going to lose insurance and a lot of other issues. Uh, we have to base our response on what that individual needs. There's a fantastic film out there called The S Word. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of it. It came out last year. It's a documentary directed by Lisa Klein that follows people who are attempt survivors. One lost survivor family, but a bunch of attempt survivors. And it is just a phenomenal film that explores, um, it shows attempt survivors as full, well-rounded people who are competent in their own safety that need to be engaged with that balance. Just a few basic principles of ideation. The risk is greater, the more frequent, the longer those thoughts last, the less controllable those thoughts are, and the fewer deterrents. So, just, I mean, this is pretty intuitive. Obviously, the more often they happen, the longer they happen, but the less controllable is, you know, there's that idea that you can have a negative thought, and, and you, uh, the more you get competent with it, you can kind of push that thought away and kind of refocus. As those thoughts become less controllable, when they, when they become more invasive, but really when it comes down to pain, I talked earlier about how pain, suicides happen when pain outweighs hope. When pain becomes the reason for the thoughts of suicide and the ideation, that's when we want to be especially concerned. But it's just that when they're still focused on an event, oh, it's because of this event, and not the pain caused by that event, the risk can be low. We're gonna spend a couple minutes just defining some of the actions related to suicide, because it's gonna help us when we look at the screening tool itself. But a suicide attempt is defined as a self injurious act undertaken with at least some intent to die as a result of the act. So there, there doesn't have to actually be self injury or harm. I can stand on this table, and if I jump off this table and land on my head, and I think that that will kill me, that can be considered a suicide attempt. Even if it's completely unlikely that I would die from that, and I think that I can die from that, or I hope to die, just the potential for it. Um, and so it's any non zero, so even if it's well, I might die, I might not die, if it, as long as there's some intent or any non-zero intent to die, but that intent and the behavior have to be linked. Those two pieces have to be connected. 
Now it begins with the first pill swallowed. So if I start to take a pill and I change my mind that I was gonna take 100, that's it's called an aborted attempt, and we'll get to that. Or if I start to cut myself and I decide not to, it does. Earlier we mentioned Kevin Berthia. In my opinion, as soon as he hopped over that railing, that's when his suicide attempt began. He aborted his attempt, but in my opinion, that's when his suicide attempt began. Uh, a colleague of mine, a friend of mine, as a military veteran, it's a really beautiful story, actually. His, uh, He's a disabled combat veteran, and he had decided to die by suicide, and so he had loaded a firearm in his car, and he had driven out to, was driving out to the desert. And his wife just intuited, she, she just knew, that's where he's at, that's what he's doing. And she called him, and he didn't pick up. And so what she did is she called every person that he has ever known. She got on Facebook, and totally, and a lot of people would say that's an invasion of privacy or whatever. She got on Facebook and said, if you love my husband, call him right now, here's his cell phone number. By the time he got to the desert, he had over 150 phone calls from guys who served with high school classmates, college classmates, text messages, we love you, please don't, please stay. And he said by the time he got to the desert, there was just no way, no way that he could go through that attempt. In my opinion, his attempt was started as soon as he got in the car. That's when he started to take actions for his suicide attempt. And so he describes himself as a suicide attempt survivor. So an interrupted attempt, you can put that story Kind of either category, it was an aborted attempt, but it was aborted because it was kind of interrupted. Uh, but uh, an interrupted attempt is typically when someone pulls the bottle or pills from you, when someone comes home, when someone interrupts. An aborted attempt is when the person begins to take steps, then they stop themselves. So I guess in, his, in that story, it's more of him deciding not to. Uh, but this is important because when we talk later about behaviors, what is an attempt and what is not, a lot of times we don't. It's, it's strange, but I hear people say, oh, you didn't, that wasn't a suicide attempt. You didn't really intend to do this, or you didn't really. It's like, no, when somebody takes that first step. Uh, so other suicidal behaviors, preparatory acts or behavior. So uh, we talked about this earlier, kind of when we were talking about warning signs, but any behavior with suicidal intent. So that could be stockpiling pills, be purchasing a gun, could be searching online for the most effective ways to die by suicide, uh, could be writing a will, it could be writing a suicide note. It could be nothing to do with suicide. It could be uh, organizing the deaths so that when you die, the files are organized so that people can easily get to the morning paper and the title. If you did that with the intent that when I, when I die, this is going to be easier for people to find stuff, um, or if I should die, you know, like, but there's an intent there with suicide. So that's preparatory after the age. We talked about this earlier, um, and I apologize that I keep for the two of you who just joined us. I probably going to do that a thousand times, so I'm just going this out. Sorry. I'm just joking. If, I, if you feel like you need me to spend time on it, just call me out. Like, hey, Stan, just, can you explain that a little bit more? And I'm only going to bust your chops for this in last session like five more times. <laughs> All right. Uh, so self-interest behavior is behavior purely for reasons other to end one's life. And we talked about the distinction before, um, but self-interest behavior um, is, it, it, it's a coping mechanism. I'm not a healthy coping mechanism, but a coping mechanism. We talked about that idea earlier about how does it necessarily indicate suicide risk, but once somebody starts to have thoughts of suicide who does self-injure, they will move from zero to 60 very quickly a lot of the times because they lack the fear of self-harm. All right, so when it comes to asking the suicide question, I know that I'm going to take you through an assessment tool, and this is maybe one of the, the gold-rated assessment tools, and it's adopted by SAMHSA, the CDC, and the National Action Alliance, and the World Health Organization. This is a really strong tool. That being said, it is still a tool. It is still a piece of paper. And I have a, a friend of mine who teaches at UCSB School of Psychiatry, and he says he has third-year psychiatrists still on the name of the board and reading on the paper. It's a tool, it's supposed to be used as a guide. It's supposed to be used as something to facilitate the conversation. And although we're gonna go through the questions, that doesn't mean you need to have this piece of paper in front of you. This doesn't, you don't even have to have this piece of paper in your presence. This is just to facilitate and guide a human conversation. I wanna tell you another story, actually, since you enjoy stories. Well, at least one of you does. All of you might be sick of my stories. But um, I was doing a focus group with a bunch of TAYU, transition age youth, years ago and we walked into the, the focus group of, I honestly I forget what we were asking for feedback on but we had asked for uh, like 10 TAYU to come in and do this focus group and it was at a 
at a center that provided <coughs> supports for a lot, a lot of homeless youth, foster youth, you know, high risk youth. And uh, through the course of the conversation, it came out that about, I don't know, 90% of the, the kids or youth in there had had experiences around suicide, suicide attempts, lost somebody to suicide. And then towards, uh, towards the end of the conversation, this one kid um, speaks up and he says, you know, I've never thought about suicide my entire life, but a couple weeks ago, <coughs> when I got kicked out of my foster care uh, setting, I've been thinking about killing myself. So rather than make a big deal about it, I said, you know, why don't we need to talk afterwards? And so I pulled him aside afterwards, and I asked the person there to grab their counselor, and he said, yeah, let me get our, you know, assessment person. And so me and the kid are sitting at a table, and this uh, this young lady comes out, maybe, uh, you know, pretty young, early 20s, comes out, and she's the assessment trainer. And she uh, she comes, and she joins us at the table, and she's got her clipboard, and she's got her pieces of paper, and oh my god, damn. <laughs> and then the first thing she does when she sits down is she takes her clipboard and she sets it over here. And I was like, all right, now let's see what, now let's see what you got. And we had about a 45 minute hour conversation with this young man. And she seamlessly blended a suicide risk assessment with the safety plan. And every once in a while she'd look over just to make sure she didn't miss anything and make a couple notes. But it was totally focused on the guy the whole time. And after we got, I mean, and usually when I sit through an assessment, it's cringeworthy. And I'm like, oh, don't say that, don't say that. Oh, man, you screwed up. Oh, man, this, this is horrible. And I was so, like, I was thrilled. I was so excited. I'm like, as soon as this lady's done, I want to figure out where she got her training, what degree she has, what letters are behind her name. And so when we got done, we sit, I decided to give us a little bit of some resources. He was going to check back in tomorrow. And I asked her, I'm like, where did you get the training? What is, what's the letters behind your name? What's your degree? And I was probably, she was probably freaking her out. She was like, well, what do you mean by degree? And I'm like, yeah, what, you're a mental health professional. What type of degree do you have? And she's like, well, I just graduated with a degree in biology from San Diego State. I'm like, is that what you mean? <laughs> <laughs> For me, it totally summed up. We do not need to be mental. Mental health professionals can do great work, and we need you in the long run, but you do not need to be a mental health professional to do a proper risk assessment. You need to be a human who has empathic concern, pays attention, is engaged in the conversation. And these tools will help guide that conversation. They do not do the conversation for you. They're not autopilot. So a few things, and I'm sure all of you know this, uh, maintaining eye contact, sitting at the person's level. Uh, Dr. David Jones has a program called CAMS. I forget what the acronym stands for. But the one thing that he did that's revolutionary in the suicide risk assessment is that instead of sitting across from the person, he pulled the chair up next to him and sit right next to each other. Now we're sitting on the same team. I'm on your side, and let's talk about this issue. Let's sit down and do the assessment. Your plan. So, little things like that. Uh, friendly, caring, telling, reflective listening. Uh, you know, avoiding things like I know what you're going through, instead saying I can't imagine what you're going through, but I want to be here for you. All right, so looking at the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale, the one that we're going to be reviewing today, it's called the Recent Screener. Um, I'll actually take you to the website before we head out today so you can see where to find all the other varieties. There's about 25 different versions of this. This is the most kind of common. This is the initial screening triage. Uh, there are some more in-depth ones. Um, and some of these, these principles that we're going to speak to have been covered today. But um, the color schemes are pretty self-explanatory. Yellow for low, orange to moderate, red to hot. So going through it, as uh, simple as this, we're going to go through the questions. I, I, I want to give you some, I talked to you about how great this is. Uh, but it's suitable for, across the lifespan for use with adults. Uh, we talked earlier about, yes, about young children, so this is one of the few that is uh, appropriate for young children. Uh, there's also some for special populations, so there's different versions for working with cognitively impaired individuals as well. But another benefit that's available in over 100 languages, which I can't think of any other assessment tool that can say that. Um, so it's just simple. The first five questions are focused on ideation, the sixth question is focused on behaviors. Uh, there's definitions included, so if you forget everything else I have, I said today, if you pick this up, it's pretty self-explanatory to navigate. Although it's ideal to have some training. So, one of the key functions of it, though, is that you, you when asked the first two questions, and depending on the question, the answer to question two, which asks specifically about suicide, you skip the next three questions, but you still ask about behavior. Because if they're not having thoughts of suicide, they wouldn't be having thoughts about plans and intent. But they might still be having behaviors like I talked about. They might still be stockpiling pills. They might still have run down a world. They might still be, uh, label some things around the house. So with that, first two questions. And this, again, 
we talked earlier about buying somebody a drink at a bar, or meeting somebody at a barbecue. You warm up the rapport, you build some trust, you say your name. You know, when I work with law enforcement officers, medical providers, one of the things I always tell them to remember, I'm not Dr. Collins, I'm not a doctor today, but I'm not Dr. Collins, I'm Stan. I'm not Officer Collins, I'm Stan. Just that little step alone humanizes so much and really builds rapport and trust for individuals. But whatever you have to do to get to this point, so have you ever thought about being dead? Have you ever wished you were dead? Have you ever woke up in the morning and not wanted to be alive? There's a thousand different ways that you can ask this question. This is a leading question. Have you ever not wanted to be alive? Because that's where most people, when they, that's where the spectrum starts. It goes from overwhelming pain and then it starts with, I just don't want to be here. And again, I think most people, most people in my life can at least identify with this emotion. You can at least identify with, I don't know, I don't think I want to be alive. My, one of my buddies is the happiest guy I've ever met. He's like a dog. He's always down to hang out. He's always happy when I see him. He doesn't understand this emotion at all, um, but most people can. Now, regardless of the answer to question one, yes or no, you're going to ask specifically, are you thinking about suicide? Are you thinking about killing yourself? Earlier I mentioned I personally prefer the term suicide. I think that's very clear. Some people will say killing yourself. It's really up to you, whatever is more natural to you. Um, and you want it to be natural. The main thing we talked about this a lot earlier, this does not say, are you thinking about hurting yourself? Are you thinking about killing yourself? You want to be extremely clear, let them know this is exactly what I'm really doing. This is what we're going to talk about. Now, once you've answered two, or once they've answered question one or two, or one and two, again, if the answer is yes to question two, you're going to proceed into questions three, four, and five. If the answer to, to Two is no, you're going to skip down to six. And one thing to remember, you'll see that the right hand side of the column is all in white on each of these, except when you get down to the bottom. This is not a board game where it's the last color that you land on is the risk category in the area. It's the last color that you check yes in is where you're at. So if you go through two yeses to yellows and you get no the rest of the way and all these are white, so you're in the white, right? No, you still come back to the yellow. Does that make sense? It's not important that you're saying, you know, don't go past the go or whatever it is. All right, so question three. Now we're actually talking about suicide thoughts with men. So this is without a specific plan or just without. So I thought about taking an overdose. Um, you'll hear people say, well, every time I walk across the trolley tracks, I think about if I ever decide to, I'm just going to lay down there. Um, they'll say, they see people think. You know, so it's not a, one of the things that we have to differentiate too is the term plan and the term intent. A lot of, uh, a lot of times those, those two terms can be interchangeable. I plan to do this and I intend to do that. In this situation, the plan is a noun. I have a plan and intent is a, is a I guess that would be a verb, ever. So you don't have to remember people. But it's an action, does that make sense? So plan is a noun, uh, intent is the verb. Um, so, have you been thinking about how you might do this? Which leads into the next, you know, that's kind of what we're looking at. So, you've had thoughts of suicide. All right, well, have you thought about how you might do this? Well, yeah, you know, I, I think about laying down on the trolley tracks. You know, when I'm having a really bad day, the trolley runs right out of my house, and, you know, I just think about laying down there. Okay, well, have you ever thought about acting on these? Have you ever been laying there late at night and you're overwhelmed with this pain? Have you ever thought about getting out of bed and walking out of the trolley tracks? Yeah, a couple times. Okay, so now what we're looking for is, have you intended, have you had something that's pulling on your heart that's drawing you towards that, that action related to suicide? All right, well, have you started to work out what that might look like? Have you started to, to think about how you might carry out this plan? Yeah, that's exactly what I did. You know, I got the pills, I've set aside the pills, I've been pulling the pills for a while now. And so now what we're building is, you know, this kind of initial thoughts, with some method, without that plan, we got the intent, and now we're looking at the combination of the plan with the intent. So once we get into this area here, once the plan has been specified a little bit more, um, that's when we're starting to get more into the high risk category. So once we go through that, we're still gonna circle back again, whether or not the answer was yes to question two or not, regardless of the answers to questions three, four, and five, if we ask them, most important part we're gonna ask about is the have you ever done anything, started to do anything, or prepared to do anything to die by suicide? Now, what would be some examples of uh, 
I, I've given you a few, but what would be some other examples? Or some examples that you've had of people have responded to this? What are some of the behaviors that people have demonstrated to you that they started working towards suicide? Closing their eyes while driving. Oh, really? I've never heard that one before. Teenager. Good. So kind of similar to drinking and driving, knowing that, you know, kind of that not 100% intent to die, but it's definitely not a non-zero intent to die. All right, what else? We talked about all the conversations you all have had just thinking about suicide. What other types of behaviors do you want to start to do? I'll give you another example since you're while you're thinking about it. Uh, a friend of mine called, her uh, dad called, her dad's in his 90s, called her, uh, I guess it's been a couple years now, uh, called her one day and he said, hey honey, uh, this weekend we drive you down to Big Five, I want to get a gun. And she said, well dad, why do you need a gun? And he said, you know, every afternoon when I go to lay down for my nap, there's a woodpecker that comes and packs on my window and makes me up. Freaking keeps me up when I'm trying to take a nap, so I'm gonna shoot him. She said, well, Dad, hey, do you think the neighbors would care? B, you never shot a gun. Why do you need a gun? And C, are you thinking about suicide? Mm -hmm. um, so that was his behavior, was acquiring means and methods through, you know, a, a, a different way. But um, what other behavior did he consistent with what was going Yeah, yeah, and consistent. Woodpecker and gun yeah. doesn't really match up. What other behaviors might people take? Get organized. Get organized? What does that might look like? Yeah, that's middle-aged or older adults. For um, for younger uh, individuals, you know, a, a teenager can fit everything they own on a post-it note, so they're not going to write a will, but they will do other things. I had a presentation at a middle school one time, and um, a kid came up to me afterwards, and he, he said, well, you talked about giving away possessions every Friday for the last month. My buddy comes over Friday afternoon after school, and he brings a duffel bag full of clothes, and video games, we get online and he transfers money into my PayPal account. Should we talk to him? I said, yeah, we should talk to him. So we talked to the kid, and he'd been thinking about suicide. And just because I was curious, I just asked the kid, I'm like, dude, why did you, why didn't you just make one trip? Why didn't you grab a bigger bag and just make one trip? And he said, well, I knew that if my mom saw that all my t-shirts were out of my house and all my video games were gone, all in one foul swoop, that she would get concerned and she would start asking questions. And so he tripled those things away. But what he was trying to do was give the things he cared about to the people he cared about, which in and of itself might not single anything. Maybe, you know, it might be the kids just want to give his friends some stuff. Uh, another friend of mine, she walked to the kitchen one day and her husband was um, paying the taxes, which doesn't sound like a morning sign for suicide, but it was mid February. And they were normally like me, April 15th, 14th, <laughs> type people. So it was out of character for her. And so, she kind of brushed it off and she thought maybe he wants to go to the return, maybe he wants to go on vacation. Uh, a couple hours later, he called her in the office and he said, hey, honey, I just want to let you know, I've organized the desk and here's all the mortgage paperwork and the car titles and the bills. And again, it was out of character because she'd been on his back for months to organize the office, but she, she let it slide. He unfortunately died by suicide that evening and it wasn't until the next day that she realized that he had also taken his favorite suit and moved it to the front of the closet and some shiny shoes gone around the house and taken the, the favorite uh, family photos and kind of moved them towards the front and dusted them off and stuff. So little stuff like that. Again, dusting off family photos doesn't necessarily seem like a warning sign for suicide, but it is a behavior that relates to whatever he's done or started to do anything. So um, again, the behavior part is really what, what we want to look at. And we also want to look at the time frame. Now this is kind of a I'm not sure where exactly they came up with the three months. I think it's a pretty safe bet as far as high risk versus moderate risk. Um, if it's three months and one day, does that mean it's not high risk? Not necessarily. Obviously, everyone is different. As we talked about earlier, what what does a long time mean? Is it is it yesterday a long time? Is it three months ago a long time? But if the behavior was less than three months, that gets them into the red category. And if the behavior is more than three months, that gets them into the orange category. So. With that, this is what we're gonna do. You're gonna roll your eyes and you're gonna rough and put bad things in the evaluations, but I really don't care. We're gonna get into groups of two, and we're just gonna practice going through these questions. 
Now you don't have to have a full backstory and you find your inner thespian. All you need to do, it's not for you as the receiver of the question, it is for the asker of the question. It's just to have the ability to run through these questions. So uh, I would like a response and you just say yes or no, whatever. Yeah. I don't have that form. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Um, so we're just gonna get the groups of two. It'd be ideal if you could not just turn over your chair, like turn your chair and actually, you know, engage with the person a little bit. It's only gonna take a couple minutes, so just running through the questions, don't stress so much, it's okay if you're looking down at it, we're just trying to practice. Ideally you're gonna look. Okay, so I do wish you were dead or I knew it was not about that one. Thoughts so regardless of the answers, um, so that was just to demonstrate, so regardless of the answers, you're still going to move through all six questions. Again, this is just a practice. Person A is going to go, person B is going to go, uh, and essentially you can slide around a little bit of turn. So we're just going to take two or three minutes of practice. Huh? Yes, I'm your client. It's like a week ago, right? Okay. <laughs> so, we talked about this idea a lot today, about that, you know, again, this is typically a 30 to 90 minute for the most part, um, but it escalates, it builds up, and the idea of the safety plan is once that risk starts to kick in, we start, they start to employ these different steps to not let it elevate. But one thing again is that we know that these crises last for a period of time. And if we can just get that person through that time, if we can just get them to hold on and breathe and stay, then we know that eventually, over a few hours, those hours <coughs> may feel like years of maybe excruciating, but we can get them back here if we can't prevent them from getting up to the top in the first place. It is not psychotherapy. It is not, <coughs> this is not for people who are, you don't employ a safety plan when someone has climbed 20 flights of stairs to stand on the top of bridge. That's not the time for safety. That is a, a time for crisis intervention. And for years and years, I'm sure many of you probably used to do these in no suicide contracts. If you're not, if you haven't heard this yet, um, no suicide contracts have been shown to be completely ineffective. In that moment, when that person <coughs> is in pain, the last thing they are thinking about is a letter they signed to you, their therapist, three months ago that they're going to harm themselves. And a lot of times, when you talk to people who really know their stuff about suicide risk, I'll tell you that once somebody has gotten to that spot, they think that they are relieving a burden onto other people by ending their life. And they, you know, one of the other things that we forget is that we, when we're trying to talk about suicide, we're trying to make logic out of an inherently illogical act. And so logic isn't always going to be able to play out on this. Um, so new, no suicide contract, this is totally different. There's research behind this, and there's uh, active research that shows that no suicide contract do not work. So, it uh, can be developed doing an after risk assessment, even um, if the individual is deemed to be at low risk for suicide. Or geez, even if the person is deemed to no, no risk for suicide, all of us should have a safety plan in place for how to de-escalate if our emotions not necessarily prevent suicide, but just what do I do with mental health issues or when I'm overwhelmed? But the risk assessment can provide us with a lot of information. Prior to the risk assessment, hey, Obviously something elevated you today, but what was it that got you here today? Okay, let's make sure that we're addressing that when we're dealing with the, um, with the safety plans. Those are referred to as activating events. Okay, so you started to have these thoughts of suicide. How did you respond? How did you behave? Okay, I started drinking, or I started getting on Facebook and looking at uh, all these negative things, or I started to listen to this uh, really sad song um, that reminds me of them. Okay, was well, there anything that you've done in the past or that you did this time? So you said you started, you started, uh, you know, having these thoughts. Is there anything in that time that helped to alleviate a little bit? And also, what we can find is earlier I talked about that method of choice, narrowing the lane, figuring out what is their method of choice. So that can all be information that informs the safety plan. I mentioned this earlier. It was based on the recovery model. Where we're coming together. We're collaborating. Um, we're working in partnerships. So there's a lot of research that also supports this as a model. Um, I think I covered most of this. Uh, most, the one important thing I will pull from this one that is new is that it's a living document. The first version, the first draft of the safety plan is not the last draft of the safety plan. 
We review it every few months, check in. Okay, since I saw you last, have you had to put a safety plan? Did it work? Okay, it worked. What well, was it effective? Okay, let's sit and, and talk about that. This will make more sense to we're breaking down the considerations. Now, talked a lot about needs restriction earlier, um, so I won't. I just thought that was an awesome picture that talked about speed bumps. So I put that in there for you. Um, we spent a lot of time on needs restriction. Does anybody have questions on needs restriction? I want to make sure we get through the safety plan part because we only got about 10 minutes, left, so I'm going to skip a little bit. All right, so basic components of a safety plan, recognizing the signs of crisis. So that's me, okay, I'm about to suicide. I'm starting to, I'm starting to get anxious, I'm starting to withdraw, okay, I'm starting to drink, or I'm wanting to reach for the drink, I'm starting to, um, I want to start thinking about where, where the needs are at, okay, those are my signs of crisis, okay. Uh, what are some coping strategies? One of the best things I ever heard from someone experiencing severe clinical depression was get up and walk out the front door. Just be outside, get some other things coming into your senses to just distract you. Um, listen to music, play a, play a song, go for, uh, go for a walk. What are my own internal coping mechanisms? Okay, that's not a work. What are some of the things I can use to distract me? As you see on the safety plan, it's people, but it's also places. So we're gonna explain what that looks like. Uh, the way that I distinguish these, and we're all adults here, and I apologize for the reference, but these, these are what I call my bar friends, and these are what I call my big friends. These are the guys that I play fantasy football with, these are the guys I play basketball with, these are the people that I can call at 2 a.m. in the morning without a disclaimer and say, I need you, can you come over right now? And so that's the distinguishing. These people in part three, we may never even mention the word suicide to them. They're just a distraction. Uh, they're just someone, hey, do you want to go to a movie, do you want to go down to the beach, do you want to go surfing, whatever it may be. So, again, step one, recognizing warning signs. And it's got some, uh, some good questions uh, included. Well, how will, you, how will you know when you need to use your safety plan? What are you as an individual? What's going to tell you that I need to start deploying my safety plan? Um, what are the experiences that you have when you start to think about suicide? Um, let me pull, pull this out. So, again, in their own words, you're going to be sitting next to them and they're going to be writing this down. And they're going to say, okay, what do I do? I, you know, it could be situations, it could be thoughts, it could be moods. Uh, it could be flashbacks, it could be PTSD. Uh, my thoughts start to race, I start getting really angry or irritable. Um, I start withdrawing, I start self hating thoughts. Okay? Why don't we take some time, write those down? What does those sound like when those, when those work for you? Alright, so you got a good idea of some of your warning signs, okay? Well, what are some of the activities you can do to prevent this from escalating? Well, we talked about this. What are some of your coping strategies? Just as individuals, not for suicide, I don't that was you tell, but well, if you're having crappy days, what's that? Go for a walk. Okay, go for a walk. Go for a swim. Go for a swim. Excellent. I'm going to swim for myself. Everything gets too bad. Yeah, exactly. What else? Listen to music. Oh my gosh. I'm in a room with helpers, and I, don't, I have three options on how we take care of ourselves. This is very troubling. I should have included a self care portion of the screen. <laughs> <laughs> go for a walk. Go for a swim. Go for a walk. Meditation. 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 Meditation, swim, what else? Play with my dogs. Play with my dogs, absolutely. Talk to your friends. Talk to your friends. Talk to yourself. Talk to yourself. Okay, sometimes you don't want to listen, right? How about a pet? You two. Sleep. Sleep? No, that's good. I need to talk. Alright. Prayer. Prayer, absolutely. Okay. Now I'm going to make sure I get one for everybody because I'm concerned about this. Talking, right? Maybe my grandson. Grandson, all right. In the back. Go for a walk. Go for a walk, right? Music. Music, all right. I don't think you got one yet. I go fishing. You go fishing? So again, when we, uh, so the fishing, the reason, the only reason I, I paused with hesitation, because the reason why I thought about that is I think it's great, uh, but one of the things we want to do is find something with few restrictive barriers. With fishing, there might be, might not be a good safety plan activity because there's a lot of barriers that can come in. It could be weather, now i got to get a boat, now i got to do this, now the road's closed. Um, 
you know, the example I use here is rock climbing, aside from the obvious danger of somebody who's thinking about suicide being already up, but we can go ahead and change that example. <laughs> uh, well, we don't want something, we know how it is. When we're bummed out, when we're depressed, it is so easy to forget. Or just go into the gym. How many of you have ever found an excuse not to go to the gym? Oh, you know what? I left my running shoes in another car. You know what? I can't find a parking spot. Oh, you know what? The shorts, I, they just, they, it's, you know, I just, I, I shouldn't go to the gym today. So we want to find things that have as few restrictive barriers as possible. Something like going for a walk, going for a swim, something where I can just get up and just get out. Just something that you can pick up and just employ right now and use it. This is the easiest and also most likely to be effective. What is, is this actually going to be effective? So, can you list some activities to take your mind off the situation? Is there anything you've done in the past that's effective? Well, I know when I go to the, the, this one park, it's just, I have a lot of good memories there. Um, I really like being there. Um, asking them how likely they would be able to do it. If they say, you know what, uh, going for a bike ride is just, it's so good for me. Well, are you actually likely to go for a bike ride? You know, I don't know about it. Yeah. Well, then you're probably not going to go for a bike ride. So make sure that there are things that they will actually, um, you know, be able to do things and activities that, um, that they have access to and that they're likely to Now, this is something that gets missed a lot. A lot of times when we talk about distractions, we only focus on keeping the people. I don't think we focus enough on settings. A lot of people, especially people in this place in their lives, have either lost connections, cut off connections, feel like a burden, and, or for a variety of reasons, or people just don't have access to other people. So, although getting people engaged is important, I think we also really want to focus on settings. And so you see that you have a few, a few there listed. Um, just a couple considerations on settings. Obviously, you don't want to say, you know, you want to avoid locations where alcohol and drugs is going to be present. You don't want to say, oh, my favorite bar down the corner. Um, ones that have negative memories of this is where my ex-wife, you know, and I got engaged or things like that. Also, places, you know, if I'm down in San Diego, so if I were going to find a room or somebody, I'd find a beast that's a level beast, not one that's on the cliffs or something like that. So just think through some of the the things, and you may not want to make that note out loud to the person. Oh, well, there's a lot of clips there, so maybe, you know, don't mention that. Just <laughs> <laughs> and say, how about Mission Bay? They got those nice parks, all those benches, that might be better. Um, and they're, we're going to order them in order of accessibility, preference in order of accessibility. So the person that's most like, I mentioned my buddy earlier, he's like a dog, and always is down for whatever, he's always in it. I can call him and he will, what do you want to do? So, yeah, let's go. Uh, so he's always in it. So, um, what we're trying to do right here is the key part is just distract. Just break the tape, break the record from this replay. Um, just get those other uh, senses going, just get other things going. This is just about distraction. There's no commitment on the people or on the places to have any crisis intervention at this point. Um, so these don't have to be people that they trust with their private stuff. These don't have to be people that are gonna disclose their suicide risk or their mental health issues. Um, we also want to pick people that are available. Like I said, people that are going to pick up the phone. My brother would be a great person for me to hang up, how hang, hang out with, but he never picks up his damn phone. So he would be a horrible person to put on my safety plan. But an, another way when people can't think of where they want to go on a bad day is they ask people, where would you want to go on a good day? If you were having just the best, if you could think about your perfect day, you got the day off and you're going to go take the lunch somewhere and go have where would you want to go? Okay, I want to go to the park or by my house. All right, then let's think about using that place when you're having a bad day. You know you like going there, you know you're happy when you feel uh, there. We also don't want to pick places where the person can be easy, easily isolated. So that's why beaches and parks and coffee shops might be good, because we're going to have other people around that individual uh, that might be able to intervene. Oh, it must be done. Oh, the show is over. Uh, so step four, now we've moved in. Now we've tried our own stuff. We've tried distracting and it's still not working. So now we're going to be engaging in our crisis response. So these are the good friends. So when everything else doesn't work, we need to, to step it in. It's different from other steps in that with this one, now we're explicitly engaging suicide. There is a specific reason why we are in contact with these people. It is implicit. For example, uh, I always compare it to uh, uh, alcoholism. Like my buddy's a recovering alcoholic. Uh, 
and I'm his, one of his people in his support network. So I have my phone set. Even during this presentation, he's one of the, the calls that will come through. So I know that if I'm given a presentation and I put it on silent and I get a call, 99% chance it's him. So I'm going to pick up that phone, even in the middle of this. I can be given a, a, a keynote of 3,000 people. I'll pick up that phone, say, hey, man, I'm a little busy. Are you good, though? I'm good? OK, I'll call you, I'll call you later. He says, I'm not good. I'm walking out of any room that I'm in. Because he is, I love you guys, but I love him way more. It's more important. <laughs> so having that, having that explicit, hey, if I call you, I need you to pick up. Two in the morning, three in the afternoon, in the meeting, whatever. Um, well, part of the conversation is, hey, who are some people that after today we can, you know, at the end of this conversation, we're going to need to find some people that you can tell that you're having these thoughts. Who are some people that you can trust with this information? And it's not, it's not an automatic, you know, that everybody's going to be supportive, so we need to take some time and weigh the pros and the cons. Because a lot of people say, oh, I should tell my spouse, I should tell my colleague at work, and I should tell my brother. Well, maybe their brother has a lost a friend to suicide. They have a lot of anger around that. Maybe their brother would be very responsive to his thoughts of suicide because they think their friend is really selfish. So even though they're great for that person's support network, maybe they wouldn't be a good fit for you. Maybe that work colleague shouldn't be exposed to this person's risk of suicide. Maybe there would be some issues around work. Maybe they're law enforcement or military. And that might create some issues. So we want to take some time and discuss the pros and cons. Also, offer to the individual, hey, if you would be more comfortable, I can contact the person. I'd be happy to, while you're here in the room, we can call the person together. I can explain to them what's going on, and we can just make up the system. From there, um, so again, here's just some sample questions. And I'll send you guys, if you all send in, I'll send, I'll send you all these PowerPoints so you have these sample questions to go off of. Uh, but just, who's been there for you? Who's somebody you trust? Who's always down for you? Who's the person that you, feel has your back and you can trust with everything. And this is where it gets tough because there's going to be a lot of people we engage with that don't feel like they have these type of people in their lives. And that's something that we're going to, okay, look, you may not have anybody right now, but we're going to keep building and we're hopefully we're going to be able to create these types of relationships for you. And if they don't have those type of people in their lives, regardless of whether they're them, we're going to figure out what are the crisis resources. So. Uh, this is again based on accessibility and likelihood of utilization. Um, the, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is there. There's a lot of people who would never call a hotline. So now we have the crisis text line. The crisis text line, similar type of uh, training that actually that young lady I talk to, uh, talked about earlier, the biology major who did a great assessment, she's a counselor on the crisis text line. That's where she had gotten her training, uh, just as some reference. So there's that. Uh, the National Lifeline and a lot of local crisis centers have a online chat room. Get on the computer, so maybe that's a format for somebody to reach out. So there's a lot of different avenues for people to reach out for supports. Um, and then also finding out what are the barriers. Well, like uh, I was just working with a, a transgender individual who didn't want to contact um, the trans lifeline because it was going to show up on the parents' phone and they'd say the number and they'd say, oh, it's this number, they Google it, trans lifeline, like, what the heck, and now it's creating more issues. So, great resource, but they would never contact me. Had a fear of what might happen. So I uh, want to ask them about um, if you're comfortable with, you know, what is your, your agency's emergency contact information? Um, and explain to them, taking time to, a lot of people don't know what to expect when they call a crisis line. And I've, I've done this a lot of times. I've never had a crisis line get mad at me. And I know I'm taking up some of their time, but that's part of their job. I'll say, hey, why don't we just call the crisis line right now together? I'm like, wait, what? Let's just call them so you know what to expect. And I'll call and say, hey, I'm Stan. I'm here with my friends. And they're thinking about, they've been thinking about suicide. I just wanted to call and let them get a feel for what it's like to talk to them. Let them talk for a few minutes and destigmatize that process. Because if someone doesn't understand that process and they think as soon as they call the cops are coming, they're never going to pick up the phone. Um, so identify those resources, destigmatize them. I mentioned both of these crisis text line, phenomenal resource. What's great about that one is somebody could be saying, you know, it's a kid in their bedroom, but they, they can't let their parents hear them talking. They can be doing it in silence. So that's another thing that's available. Uh, Share information on the My3 app, so once you've done that safety plan, you can encourage the person to download the My3. All that information is going to be there. It's also got a one-stop button to get the National Lifeline, and a one-stop button to hit 911 if that person needs to. 
Um, yeah, and I would encourage you to download it today. Just play with it, mess around with it. Uh, pretty customizable. If you have any feedback, let us know. Uh, again, we don't own it anymore. We gave it to Lifeline. Uh, but just, again, it's not a replacement. It's a digital copy. It's a way for people to have their safety plans with them all the time. Uh, this is a fantastic freaking resource. It's called Now Matters Now. It's for people coping with suicidal thoughts. What it is, uh, for those of you familiar with Dialectical Behavioral Therapy, DBT, it's a website that kind of empowers individuals with DBT. So there's a lot of uh, skills going on there. There's a lot of uh, de-escalation, a lot of decompression. Um, so when you go on the video, there's this, or you go on the website, this website is for like a crisis de-escalation for individuals. So really strong resource, a very empowering resource. A lot of positive feedback on that. Um, there's a ton of resources out there on SBRC. If you go to suicidesafetyplan.com, you can also download that. And with that, uh, sorry, we're actually five minutes over. Is that right? Was I supposed to end five minutes ago? I, think? Uh, I don't know. Great. We're still making noise over there, sister. Uh, well, uh, so with that, there's a ton of different evaluation forms you need to fill out. So Juka will explain them again if you need yeah. them. Um, so you, um, sorry. And everybody signed in with their email and stuff. Does that make it square yeah. rounds? Does anybody have? Uh, should be back there. Okay. Before we close out, any questions? It's been nice hanging with you all for a couple hours. I'm sorry uh, again about session three, but I got about 10 more minutes uh, energy. Okay. energy. So I apologize for cutting it short. Um, I hope you don't feel a short change yeah. by the day. Uh, thank you for all that uh, you do. Thanks for being here. You will get an email from me from, uh, after today. Uh, probably not today. After today, at some point, you get an email just with the PowerPoint so you can take them, use them, whatever. I don't care. Uh, they're for you to play with. If you can help spread the word, please do it. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, please let me know in any other activities that we'll be doing. I'll keep you posted on. But uh, any questions? And you, uh, Shandruka, do you have the sign-in sheet? Yes. Okay. So. You're not, I have a word to say. Sorry, go ahead. Oh. Um, so, I'll pass the sign in sheet around again. I think folks just sign the top part of it, so we can sign the bottom one as well. And then for the individual one pagers that a few folks have questions about, if you're getting CMEs, you don't need that one form. Someone had a question about that. That's just for the PBS CDs. If you have any questions, because I'm sure you guys will. You can come talk to me afterwards or there are folks in the front too that you can chat with. But I'm gonna um, send around the sign-in sheet right real quick and then I think everyone has all the copies of every sheet out. Good to do it, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Again, other than that, nice to meet you all. Um, I hope, like I said, I hope you learned a little bit today and more importantly, I hope you walked away a little bit more comfortable just to jump in there and that you are more qualified to do this than you may realize. So thank you all, it's nice to meet you.